So welcome everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we're here to discuss the future challenges of IoT together with Hub Security's very own senior product manager, Tal Shamesh. Um, we're joined alongside a number of IoT and security experts, including Saya Manor, Lydia Yusupova, Carlos Queros, uh, and Severo, uh, Severio, excuse me, Romeo. Thank you guys so much for being here today. I'm super excited and looking forward to our discussion. Um, we're going to start our webinar with a brief introduction from Tal Shemesh on the security challenges related to the Internet of Things, and then our panelists will each get a chance to introduce themselves. Um, afterwards, we'll get into a deeper discussion on everything related to IoT challenges, threats, and the solutions um, that exist to address them. As usual, we'll leave about 30 minutes at the end of our discussion for a short Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section below and uh, we'll get to them later on. Now we have an impressive lineup of panelists tonight and I'm excited to have them introduce themselves to you. Um, but first we'll begin with a few words from Tal before we hand up the mic for introductions. Um, take it away, Tal. Thanks, Terni. Uh, hi everyone, uh, Tal Shemesh, Hub Security Product Management here um, in the company a few months now. And um, as an intro to today's discussion uh, about IoT, Internet of Things, it's, it's a concept that um, we have kind of a decade since it started uh, emerging. Um, and now it becomes an integral, integral part uh, of uh, our life. We all recently heard of uh, Meta, former uh, Facebook company, of their uh, goal to build a metaverse where uh, we will connect the physical and digital world. And we all hear about uh, surgeons uh, um, surging and on a patient uh, using a virtual reality glasses. So um, the, um, the technology is here and um, we are building and living uh, in a future uh, connected environment and with it, uh, um, it brings with it concerns and challenges. And in today's discussion, uh, we will cover the basics of what is IoT technology in terms of market and use cases and uh, what challenges and threats um, security uh, wise as well as uh, deployment uh, wise. Um, we are already facing uh, with the IoT uh, into our uh, complex global network of uh, technologies. And um, we will also present uh, existing and future approaches how to mitigate these uh, challenges and uh, threats. Thank you, Tal. Uh, and I'm excited to have you. Can you guys hear me? I don't know. Yeah. 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 So thank you, Ta, and we're excited to have you here. And um, yeah, this is our first webinar together. So yeah, that's good. true. Um, okay, let's take a few minutes to do some introductions, starting with uh, Sai. Would you mind giving our listeners a bit of background on yourself and your field of expertise? What perspective you're bringing today? Sure. Um, my name is Sai Amanor. Um, I'm a senior research engineer at Lindy. I'm based in uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, and um, so I'm part of what's called the um, IoT and digital applications group. And our focus is to actually develop um, low cost IoT devices for um, Lindy cust uh, Lindy's customers. Um, in case you're not familiar, Lindy makes um, industrial gases. And like, you know, we are not in the business of making connected devices. So our, like, you know, our goal is to sell more gas um, so our devices need to be um, really, really low cost. Um, so our group focuses on identifying challenges for our customers and see how we could um, help them. This could, you know, be a, a range from something like remote monitoring um, to uh, building, uh, you know, um, um, you know, building something quite customized uh, for our um, customers. And I've been with Lindy for about four years now. And I've seen uh, varying kinds of uh, projects, and it's uh, you know it keeps me, uh, you know I keep uh, I, I keep getting challenged on a daily basis. Yeah, and we're super excited to have you here with us today. So thank you for joining. Um, next, Libby. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. 
Uh, Lily Yusupova, I'm with Schneider Electric. We're a global company that focuses on software and infrastructure for technical solutions. And I'm an account executive here. And really my role is to work with companies that need technical solutions. And my job is to collaborate with them and give them a consult consultative approach to their challenges. So this is a really exciting topic because as uh, devices keep growing, as technology keep growing, you know, we all need to get together and kind of see the challenges and how do we solve it and solutions out there that can support it. So thank you for having me. Definitely. Thank you, Lily. Thanks for being here. The video, Romeo, yep, next. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. First of all, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to uh, everyone. Um, my name is Saverio Romeo. I, I come from a telecom background. I looked at how machines talk to each other 25 years and more ago. You can see my white hair. Uh, and uh, I stayed there um, until now. The only thing that is in the last six, seven years, I have uh, kind of two faces on one side. <clears throat> I still look at the IoT. Uh, from, uh, let's say, more uh, consultancy or in-field uh, application side. Uh, on the other side, I collaborate with the University of London. We have a Center for Innovation Management Research at Burbeck, where we actually look at how companies and public sector uh, adopt emerging digital technologies, including IoT. So what that means, challenges for society, for economy, for companies, benefits. So, um, I'll bring a bit of this angle. Mm bit more academic angle if you want to, a bit more critical if you want. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. And uh, again, we're, we're very happy that you could join us. Thank you. Uh, Carlos, you're, you're last. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shorty, and thank you uh, guys for having me. So my name is Carlos Queiroz. I'm based in Porto, Portugal. So I'm an electrical engineer. Um, all my career, I've been managing and, and delivering IoT and software projects uh, quite around the world. Uh, currently, I'm head of platform partnerships at Infraspeak. Infraspeak is the first intelligent maintenance management platform in the market. And my role is pretty much around adding value to uh, an existing platform with IoT softwares and other tools that can build an intelligent operation. So I'm like an IoT buyer that uh, builds a solution for our, our clients in order to have a better operations. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Carlos. Uh, and thanks for being here as well. Um, so before we di dive into uh, today's discussion, um, just a little overview, we divided today's uh, event into three topics. Um, we're going to start with our first topic, which is just an introduction, uh, a bit of background and introduction to IoT technology, including um, the market and some use cases. Um, we have people here with, with some knowledge and we have uh, people here with a, a lot of knowledge. So we're going to start from the top and work our way down. Um, second topic, we're gonna to talk about challenges and threats that exist. Um, and in the third, we will address approaches and solutions. So let's start off with um, Sai. Why don't you start us off? Um, what is IoT and how is it shaping the future? Um, I can tell you uh, from the perspective of uh, remote monitoring um, at my uh, job, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Internet of Things uh, enables um, you to uh, build a system, you know, um, back in the day, um, if you have um, a tank of liquid carbon dioxide, um, all you could do was... Um, 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 have a gauge, um, a floating level gauge that uh, that gave you that you know that gave you the um, amount of um, gas that's left for a particular fast food restaurant, um, you know, and the way they used to refill uh, products for um, such customers was uh, on a regular basis. Like they would know on what frequency the the customer uh, needs the product to be refilled. 
um, and, and you know they just send the truck on a on a routine basis and like you know and they also try to hedge their um, uh, you know tank levels by sending it advance in advance of a weekend or a long holiday weekend and that's where iot comes in where you are you can now add a remote telemetry unit that reports the data to the cloud this could be either using a wireless sensor node or um, you know, or directly uh, pop a, a cellular module on top of the uh, tank um, that basically constantly rep reports its, you know, levels uh, once an hour on a regular basis or maybe just twice a day. And this enables you to actually plan um, your allocation better. Um, it also helps, um, it, like, uh, at the same, not only are you benefiting from the data that's collected from your customer end, uh, you know, where, where it actually helps you, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, allocate resources. But at the same time, it is also helping the customer. Let's, you know, let's say that, you know, we actually detect a leak in the system because it's possible to tell when are you refilling the product? Uh, you know, when have you last replenished it? Based upon their usage patterns and things like that, um, IoT enables you to actually detect leaks in the system. Um, you know, you can also uh, provide um, a value to your customer where you can actually share a, a, a visual dashboard of like, you know, what's going on at all of their locations. Um, and I think that's where, you know, uh, you know, it's it's exciting what you can do um, today, but just by adding something um, to a simple sensor that uh, you know that keeps reporting data. Definitely, and uh, potential um, is unmeasurable. Um, Carlos, at, as head of platform partnerships at Infraspark, uh, Infraspeak, excuse me, how are your customers yeah. now using your IoT? Yeah, so uh, basically, as I, as I said, so we, we, on top of our intelligent platform, we build the solutions our client need, right, to have intelligent and efficient operations. And what, in order to uh, make this possible, we need data. And, for, and we see IoT as one of the most valuable data sources of, uh, in the market, okay? So what we search for in IoT is to enable us that we keep gathering data and keep feeding the algorithms that make the operations more intelligent and more efficient. And to give you some examples in this, uh, we are all in this uh, return to office uh, uh, module, uh, especially in hybrid work. Uh, and in this module, the facilities, let's imagine an office building uh, is not anymore some place that the, uh, every day 1000 people go to work uh, it's there for us to use. And then from time to time, we have to give small attention to it. No, facilities, they are living operations where the occupancy, the comfort and the security of everyone can change from one, another, one moment to another because one time you can have 20 people in a building and, and another day you can have 1,000. So uh, pragmatic examples of how we are using IoT to help our customers in this uh, struggle is for example, for offices and hotels, we track the occupancy, the footfall or the air quality, um, and we trigger automatically uh, cleaning, maintenance or support tasks based on what is happening in real time. In hospitals, we can uh, uh, track assets, uh, critical assets to make sure that they are secure, they are in the place and the time uh, where they are needed uh, when they are needed by the medical teams or for example for someone that is providing a service to the facilities we are able to monitor the the assets 24 7 and to predict when something is required and not only to to be always reactive to an operation so for, again for us it's a, a very important data source so we can keep making intelligent decisions well, what are some of the benefits that you would um, say that IoT brings for businesses? I mean, of course, Carlos now and Sai mentioned a few. Maybe you can expand a bit upon this. Yeah. Um, in continuous to what they say, um, we see that for businesses, uh, the IoT is a true innovation, meaning that we have tiny devices with the powerful algorithms behind them that they completely transform uh, modern uh, industries. 
reducing expenses and increasing working efficiency and uh, reducing and eliminating, eliminating risks. Um, there is a, a forecast that the worldwide is going to spend uh, by 2022, $1 trillion um, in IoT for businesses. And of course, the benefits of implementing IoT um, are, are per each, uh, let's call it um, vertical, industry vertical. Uh, businesses report 94, uh, for 94% of businesses that use IoT, they report on a return of investment of um, almost um, a year that they uh, already returned their investment. So it's it's something that they uh, enjoy and uh, and uh, see revenue also and uh, uh, reduce cost. So let's take uh, manufacturing uh, plants. They uh, they're going to be enjoying um, in, uh, incre increasing productivity and minimizing unexpected expenses and uh, reducing the staff and the human labor. And uh, if we take fleet management, that uh, they uh, improve their um, um, delivery tracking and mileage and fuel expenses and agriculture uh, evolution with the smart greenhouses that we see and crop monitoring and the medical uh, industry also. We have remote health monitoring and the health data analysis, even retail businesses. Um, they can enjoy better marketing and business development and improved customer service um, and even a stronger image of the company. It's really helping in, in many areas and um, we see it growing every day. Thank you, Tal. Um, definitely, IoT um, is a fundamental building block um, in digital transformation, which we're seeing. Um, and the next level of sophistication comes when IoT uh, converges with other uh, technologies. Saverio, maybe you can tell us what are, what are some of the main technologies under the radar of IoT suppliers? Okay, so I think also building on the on the discussion coming from uh, SAS Carlos Central, uh, you know, traditionally what we have done, we have really monitor assets, remotely monitor assets, so observing them, observing their behavior, uh, ideally uh, being able to locate problems in these in these assets. And what we want to do, the next step we want to do. We want actually to be able to predict the behavior of these assets, not just monitor, monitoring them real time or, or even not real time, but predicting and maybe also acting in an automated way on these assets. Now, the IoT doesn't, does not do these things. The IoT is that layer that sends the space with the sensor gather the data and with the connectivity layer, send the data to uh, a cloud potentially uh, where, the, where the intelligence is happening and intelligence requi requires uh, analytic systems. Now, uh, in order to do prediction, in order to do uh, prediction of behavior of events, you, you need to converge artificial intelligence or branches of the artificial intelligence science with the IoT. And today what is happening is primarily around the use of machine learning around using the data that the IoT layer gathers. Uh, and uh, the other element that is uh, everyone is talking, we are debating a lot, is where this intelligence needs to happen. Where do you take the decision? Do you take the decision only in the cloud? Or you have situations in which you need to take the decision real time at the edge where the devices are? And therefore, there is the discussion about the edge computing. Another way of discussing the story, uh, Sai talked about the, the, the gas systems, for example. Now we want to have the map of the pipelines. How do we have this map of pipelines? We can think about digital twins of the pipeline system. And this is another type of tech that work with the higher team. Uh, the other area that's, uh, um, which is not really something new for the IoT, but is about uh, reinforcing the connectivity capability that there is behind the IoT in order to gather this data and send this data is the 5G. Now, we, there is a lot of, I'm sure you know better than me, that there is a lot going on around the use of 5G for mm -hmm. the IoT. 
which is the purposes of it, which are the dangers, where do you do it? I saw in the chat some, uh, a person from Telecom, and I don't remember the name, sorry, was mentioning about uh, mobile edge computing, which is coming with 5G. Uh, the idea of private networks, for example, an organization that has its own 5G network for doing IoT and other things, its own environment. There are a lot of uh, IoT healthcare scholars I read on the, on the, and on the, on the chat. Uh, what does it mean for, for healthcare environment? And the healthcare environment are particularly complicated. And not much from a technological point of view, and here I'm starting to be a little bit more critical because we talk about a lot of tech, but the real problems are not really tech. The real problem is more about the management of data, the ability, the skills that you have in the organization, the exchange of that data. For example, in an healthcare environment, you need to exchange data among hospitals, GPs, particularly if the system is a state-owned system. There is a lot of complications that maybe are not that tech. So these are some, some of, ex, of, of, um, of the projects we are talking about. There is a lot of, um, for example, the idea of embedded SIM uh, is interesting. And also from a security point of view is another point of discussion. Um, and I think, I, uh, yeah, I, I think I said, I said the main stuff. One message I want to say that uh, we need to be uh, frame, the frame of mind in IoT should be multidisciplinary in a sense that we will talk and we will work with a lot of external, with a lot of expertise, very diverse and not necessarily digital tech. Now, when you do IoT in healthcare, the, the partnership, the ecosystem will involve healthcare specialists, healthcare tech specialists that are not necessarily linked to the IoT, but today they are coming together with the IoT to drive the digital transformation of the healthcare system of the hospital and so on. Definitely. So, so from, from what we can, we understand already, uh, it takes a village, right, to build this uh, IoT infrastructure. Lily, is more investment needed then? Absolutely. Everything we've talked about thus far, whether it's the trillion and more investment, the healthcare, the being able to share all this data, we can't do that without a robust backbone. So we need more, you know, more infrastructure in fiber. We need more infrastructure in, in supporting the capabilities of IoT out there. You know, the you can't get the data if you don't have the proper connectivity, if you don't have the proper backup. Um, if you think of the last uh, what year and a half, what we've had to handle, we've understood that now connectivity is not just a want; it's a need. Whether it's a hospital system needing that data or a child needing to be connected at home uh, to do their schoolwork. So it is absolutely needs a lot more um, infrastructure support. And, you know, some countries have done a much better job than others. I think in North America, we need a little bit more help, even though we're Western and we're very much progressed in the types of solutions we have here. We, we're, we're really missing here is that connectivity piece that Severino also mentioned on. And something that's really needed, and hopefully, you know, we'll we'll get more funding with the infrastructure bill coming up here to support that. Uh, you know, Europe's done a decent job of connectivity. Even some parts of Asia have done a really good job. But there's there's more need to be done. If everything we're talking about, all the connected products, solutions, they're going to need more fiber. They're going to need more backup. They're going to need more ways to communicate with each other and get that data. And you know, software management, we don't really talk a lot about that, but managing the software of IoT is also that key piece. So I absolutely think that there's gonna be a lot more investment needed uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna be that um, if we're gonna be that, you know, looking far ahead. We also need to think about the resiliency and also backing up that data. That's why you have data centers out there, and now you have a lot of edge sites out there who focus on that. And you know, if we start talking about even uh, driverless cars, right? A lot more infrastructure, a lot more backbone is going to need to be supported in all those aspects. Thanks, Lily. Um, moving on to our second topic, which uh, addresses challenges and threats. Carlos, uh, other than investment or lack of investment within uh, infrastructure, what are some of the other obstacles that prevent IoT-based operations from becoming a more common reality and becoming more ubiquitous. 
I, I think the uh, I just want to, to to connect a bit with what Lily just said because the points that I wanted to point out are uh, a bit related with the lack of investment. But I would say that the lack of investment is maybe connected with the, the lack of vision. Okay, because um, the facilities and the infrastructure itself was not built uh, thinking to be prepared for this age, right? Where everything is connected. And uh, as, a, as a person that is always looking into, especially facilities, um, to, to try to build solutions, most of the time the challenge is, uh, is the connectivity, but the connectivity because the whole facility, even if it was uh, done six months ago, was not thought in a way that the devices could connect, that they have enough uh, bandwidth, that they have enough uh, sensors that, uh, you know, so even if it's very recent and, it, and the IoT and, and the Internet of Things is a topic that is being uh, talked long years now, um, when you are in the field, you see that it's only on the academic level. On the, uh, on the state investment level and on private investment level, that's a topic that is never the priority. To, so it is not, let's build something that allows us to lately uh, adopt an IoT-based operation. I think that's, that will be my, my highlight as the biggest, problem, biggest blocker I see uh, when I work in this sector. Where do you see that investment coming from? Is it private or public? Where do you see the onus and responsibility falling? I think it's it has to be both, right? So uh, as usually as the big investments, for example, the one that Saverio uh, talked and probably is, uh, has more knowledge on that than me, but for example, 5G, if the, the, the governments don't do a, a push, I don't think that the private sector itself will do all the investment by alone, right? So I think it has to be a mix between both. Um, the public sector has to give a push because the economies will be much more efficient, much more, it will create, the, the thing with, with IoT and 5G and the technology that Saverio talked about is that, uh, it's obviously more efficiency, uh, more speed and et cetera, but it will create use cases that don't exist today. And I think that's the topic that has to be the public sector to realize that, okay, in order for this to be possible and the economies to innovate, we need to, to do a first step. But those are my five cents. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, so video, developing an IoT solution is, uh, as we hear, often not very simple, um, and it requires a lot of decision making. As an IoT research associate at, at STL, what are some of the main challenges you're facing day to day? I want to, first of all, I want to just jump on what Carlos said, and then I, I go to you. I, I think in the IoT, we should distinguish um, a kind of uh, uh, waves of development. Yeah, there, there, there is a sort of first wave of companies who have invested and have done very interesting things on the IoT. <clears throat> and we should not uh, underestimate uh, that phase. Uh, the problem of the IoT is that uh, level of sophistication that certain companies have demonstrated are demonstrated is not spread. Uh, therefore, for example, it's problematic for SMEs to think about IoT in a certain way. Uh, it's problematic for a variety of reasons that are, in my opinion, not really technological, but the typical reason of the problems of an SME of time, skills, management, and investment. Um, on, on your question, so the, the, if you take the case of the hospital, yeah, and we want to do an IoT deployment into an hospital, what do we do? We need to deploy and plan the sensors. And these sensors are very diverse because these sensors need to do different things. Yeah? So we have a population of sensors that gather different type of data. And we want this data all together because we want to have the agnostic view of the hospital. Then we gather them, we send this data to an IoT platform. Uh, and in the IoT platform does a number of things without going details, at least does the device management, does a bit of uh, data storage, a bit of data management. And then we want maybe use this data to do stuff. We want to enable developers to do applications. 
for uh, doing this, we want to ensure the security of all these at any level. Yeah, we don't want to have holes at, at any level of this of this stack. To do this, that is means integrating different tech. And integration itself is not an easy piece of work. It's something that uh, needs to come together among different expertise, and therefore the management of this different expertise is very important. Uh, the, the, the second point, I would say the second challenge is that the, the IoT solution deployment does not happen like that. It goes face to face, and there is a lot of phases in which you need to test. And the testing phase in an IoT deployment is extremely important because only in that way you can find problems, actual the sensor are sensing what I want the sense, uh, where, do, where are these data, which is the format of the data, what do I do with this data, in a testing phase and in a proper way I can understand that, yeah? And, and then when I design the solution, I think there should be a security frame of mind. Today was published by the IoT Security Foundation here in the UK, a report on consumer IoT data, in which basically, I don't remember exactly the percentage of companies not really doing security on their device, quite very high, and which is extremely dangerous for a variety of reasons. So um, I, I think the challenge is into uh, planning the, develop, the design and the development of an IoT solution in a proper way. Without the rush of being plug and play, Please, the plug and play is difficult to get to the plug and play. Let's be honest. If we do a deployment of millions of devices, the plug and play is difficult, in my opinion. I mean, my experience is almost impossible. So there are, there are a lot of challenges that can be faced, in my opinion, in a very successful way if there is a, a, a proper multidisciplinary team working on a, on a development step-by-step -step framework uh, with particular attention on the testing POC phase of it. I feel like that was a mic drop. Did anyone else feel a mic drop? Um, <laughs> I heard it. Yeah. Uh, Sai, uh, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the more immediate challenges um, that are associated? I mean, we just talked about a few, including security. Um, are there any that you guys are facing, uh, uh, not you guys specifically, but you guys have experienced um, in your, in, uh, when it comes to IoT deployment uh, when working with clients? Um, like, you know, the immediate uh, cliff that we have to get through is the, um, you know, the supply chain crisis. Like, you know, you like your customer wants the device, you want to build it, you have the resources to build it. What's happening right now, like even this morning, I was putting out a small fire with um, uh, like a component shortage, you know, it's, it has become like this, you know, this circle, um, uh, you know, uh, you keep going in circles, trying to actually like find one component or the other. Um, we are in a place where, you know, we have lead times of 46 weeks and upwards of that. Um, so uh, where do you draw the line, right? Like, you know, it, it basically comes down to, okay, do we find drop in replacements? Um, is that like, you know, and in some cases when the lead, um, lead times for components are upwards of a, a year, you immediately start to think, okay, should we redesign this product, you know? And it's not um, such a, you know, it's not easy to answer um, uh, uh, those questions because you have invested a, a certain amount of time and you have actually optimized the product around a particular component. And in some cases, uh, you might be dealing with applications where, um, uh, for example, um, it's probably used in, uh, being used in a healthcare application or it's probably being used in a classified environment where you cannot get away with uh, substituting components and um, uh, products. So you kind of have to like, you know, uh, um, uh, keep going in circles. Like what, I would say one of the immediate challenges is um, actually dealing with the supply chain crisis. And the other thing uh, that comes to my mind is actually, um, I don't know who was talking about it. It's important to actually, um, you know, talk to people who are actually using the product because 
um, these days with um, the availability of um, IoT technology out there, you can actually solve 96% of the problem that you're trying to solve uh, with your product. And it's usually the last 4% that creates um, um, all sorts of problems. Uh, you know, so it's important to find out how people are going to use it. How is it going to be, uh, you know, like, you know, can you get away with making certain trade-offs? And, uh, you know, it's important to have those conversations because I, what I have noticed is that we keep going in circles um, at the very last moment. And, you know, uh, like iterative pro product development is good, but it's import also important to actually understand the customer's use case better. Um, and, you, you know, you don't need to over-optimize, but at the same time, you know, it's important to have that conversation. Is this a video nodding his head, um, right? Does it, does I just want to add, absolutely, I'm say 100%. Um, I also, I like to add that in this conversation with the, with the customer, uh, the conversation should be a sort of on and on. You know, the IoT uh, solution has a life cycle that is, is, is not going to die. You want to update it. And you want to update it for a variety of reasons. Could be a security update, but could also be because you want to add more devices. And, and these life cycles require the involvement of the customer. And this involvement of the, the customer require a form of support. Many times you have situation in which the customer does know who to call where the solution does not work. Who are called? The operators are giving connectivity. I call Sai, I call Carlos, I don't know who. So in this conversation, the support of IoT in the life cycle is very important for the provider of IoT solution. Thank you. Thanks, Saverio. And um, Lily, over to you. I, I wanted to ask, what are some crit critical ways uh, that new IoT technologies are creating threats to infrastructure we discussed a few already, maybe you can give us your perspective as well. Yeah, so, you know, Sai brought up a good point on supply chain, right, and the challenge of su supply chain today. And I think um, I want to share that that is really showing the need for IoT, because there is a, a demand right now that we just can't keep, right? So even as a manufacturer, there's a demand out there that we're trying to get out to our customers that we're, we're balancing. So. I think that that need is important to recognize, and the challenge is, is really stems from being able to to support those IoT needs capabilities, and they're going to be very different, right? It's going to be different for healthcare versus telecom, but um, focusing on those this different capabilities that they're looking to fulfill, and I think we also need to understand that with infrastructure, we also are trying to be sustainable about it. So that brings an extra core to this conversation that you know, we don't think of. But as more devices are growing, as more IoT is growing, as companies, we also need to figure out how to be more sustainable about it. And that's really a big infrastructure challenge. So a good example is, right, so in a, an area like, and I'm gonna pick on California, but where there is uh, not consistent power, right? So we need to be able to find a better ways to support backing up that IoT capability. And we're trying to do a better job of it instead of using, you know, fuel for generators or the grid, you know, we're, we're coming out with solutions like microgrids and coming out with best systems that are lithium ion based that are reducing emissions. So I think the challenge is two part. One is supporting the capability that the IoT uh, specific, you know, vertical is trying to support, but also we also need to be very conscious of how we support that infrastructure for them as new products come out, making sure that we're focusing on that sustainability aspect as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, turning back to security for a second, tell what are some of uh, some of the security concerns that maybe we haven't heard of yet um, that are surrounding IoT, um, and what are some of what are some of the most vulnerable attack surfaces that exist for these devices? So um, Severio mentioned it um, a bit, and we can I, I can dive in in some of uh, the examples. We are taking uh, something that it looks simple that we take a device and connect it to a network, but it brings it with it a lot of complexity. Um, we have incorrect access control. We have a device 
that should be accessible only to its owner or people in the immediate environment that the device should trust connected to a local network but now it's connected to the internet so typically or theoretically everyone can access it um, this is one aspect we have um, issues that we call trusted execution in, environment or lack of uh, this these iot devices are a general purpose computers in many cases that they have um, that they can run a specific software so now attacker can attack it, access it, and run any software that he sees fits, that he see fits to attack the network or to access the data, running a DDoS attack through the device. So uh, the lack of trusted uh, execution environment is really issue here. Insufficient physical security. These IoT devices are, are real devices spread all over the world. You can physically access a camera, and uh, take control of its uh, memory and uh, take uh, and copy the contents of uh, the memory. So um, physically securing the devices is an issue as well. Uh, privacy protection, all these devices hold and may hold and, and store sensitive information, whether it's uh, uh, video cameras that are taking uh, uh, videos of uh, the streets, uh, that we live in or uh, audio recording so the data is private we need to secure it uh, and we need to be aware of it and the attack surface that we see is that since we had a, we have a lot of devices and each device has a memory and firmware and physical interface it, it um, uh, exponentially um, increase the, um, the exposure and we have a lot of communication channels. We are integrating to a lot of the different networks. So the, the protocols that are used need to be protected and be secured. And the applications and software that these devices are using and running, they, they can have and hold a lot of vulnerabilities. Again, the attack surface is, is coming from three, I mentioned here three major uh, uh, vectors, but um, since we have we are talking about a lot of devices and the network is huge, it really uh, exponentially increase and uh, you have to face them wisely. Uh, as Saveri also said, you have to plan it and revisit it all the time. Definitely. Uh, and, and on that note, Saverio, um, too often uh, the focus is uh, technological centric when we talk about IoT. What are some other considerations? Libby brought up sustainability. Do you have anything else to add to that list? <clears throat> uh, so, first of all, there is a, 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 um, an important skill slash management uh, issue to uh, to address um, in, in, in is twofold. On, on the adoption side, uh, there is sometimes uh, completely or very poor understanding of what an IoT solution is and why I'm going to do the IoT solution. Yes, what the objective of doing it, uh, and uh, um, and therefore there is also. So I'm talking about management level, and then there is the lack of skills internally to an organization and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working with small medium enterprises and I, I see their suffer uh, you know, they do not have the actual people prepared to do certain things therefore they need to go out and engage with the uh, with other organizations and uh, the skills is uh, in, in IoT and, and then if we look at the convergence IoT AI IoT uh, augmented reality I didn't mention before before we're talking about supply chain IoT DLT for example is very important in in in, in, uh, in the supply chain is is quite comp is quite complicated issue forming skills in universities uh, that are able to cover the needs of the enterprises and this is a challenge that we have as a, not as a company if you want but as a as, you know educational system and and the, and the economy uh, also, I think, uh, and Tal mentioned a bit, we need to look at the ethics of this stuff. You know, we are dealing with data that is very close to us, particularly when we talk about consumer IoT, but not only, you talk about smart home, for example, the smart healthcare again. Uh, you know, the electronic patient record, 
which is a type of data healthcare information that I'm sure our uh, friends for healthcare know are data by us and are data that can be gathered and exchanged in an IoT scenario. So we need to understand the ethics of what we are doing. Are we, um, it's not just invasion of privacy, it's just it's how you use those data. Do you use it in a proper way? Do you misuse it? And, 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 and we know all the misuse of data that is happening. Um, Another aspect I want also to highlight from an ethical point of view is these technologies are exacerbating this diversity or are solving diversity, economic diversity, gender diversity. We need to think about this stuff in the debate we are having today. A last point that uh, Lily uh, highlighted is sustainability. Today we are debating about the climate change, COP26 and so on, which is the role of the IoT into this? Which is the role of emerging digital technologies into this? Is, is a, a positive role? There are some negative elements to consider. We deploy all these devices all over the place. This is electronic waste at some point. What do we do with it? So I, I think then now uh, these variables are entering, in my opinion, should enter into the into the design and deployment of an IoT solution. We cannot really just think from a revenue perspective. Yeah. We need to think of what we are doing. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and these are, I think, some consideration that as a community, but generally as adopter of the IoT, and because the IoT is for, the, for all the economy, as the economy, we should consider when we talk about the IoT. We should start talking a bit more and taking a bit, bit more action, probably. Definitely. I have that passion with you, Sabrio. I have that passion with you, because it is very important to think about. You know, the IoT for green can do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, environmental monitoring, prevention, uh, water scarcity, leak jays, all, all this stuff. We need to do it. Uh, and as Carlos said, we need someone who invested in it. If you look at the water systems worldwide, it's probably one of the most important deployment we can solve with the IoT, and we are not doing it. You know, I'm coming from a what? small village in South Italy. We are still dealing with leaks without being able to prevent it with the technology or fires. Oh, fires. Yeah. Wildfires. Hi, uh, you had something to add to that. Yes. Um, uh, I think Saverio actually brought a very good point about skills um, and, you know, uh, how organizations, uh, you know, try to deal with it. Um, and I wanted to share, uh, you know, my own uh, personal example. Uh, my employer recognized the fact that they actually needed a group that focused on IoT devices and uh, applications. And, you know, they were willing to hire me from all the way from uh, West Coast. And I was a little bit taken aback myself. And when I, when I started with my current employer, it was just the two of us um, that's, you know, that was trying to um, you know, uh, trying to do something uh, new. And with, with it, uh, you know, it, uh, the, it has its own challenges because you're working in a space where people who don't necessarily understand how things work in your area. So as like, you know, so it's important to, uh, you know, establish yourself as the expert um, to be able to um, educate other people um, so, uh, you know, you have to explain to internal stakeholders um, how long it could take to develop uh, such products uh, because, you know, we are developed, like, you know, we are in uh, working um, for an industrial gas manufacturer where the projects there could take a really long time, whereas IoT devices don't necessarily take that long, but they come with their own challenges. Um, uh, uh, as to like, you know, it can, like, you can achieve a price target only if you make n number of these things, and it could take a really long time to make that quantity. So I think that's where, um, you know, skill sets and like, you know, hiring the right person um, comes into play. It's important to uh, be able to like, you know, advocate for yourself as well as for your customer, uh, you know, as to um, how things might go. And when, when Saverio mentioned about skills, I thought I should uh, uh, definitely add something to it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Sai. Um, so what are some of those key areas uh, that you mentioned focusing on during product development? Um, what are some key areas that people can, can focus on in order to avoid problems later downstream? 
Um, so when I got started, um, I actually um, took a tailor-made um, approach to my product development where I was uh, specifically focusing on a particular application that's going to be used in a very specific scenario. And uh, when uh, time came for the next product, um, it turns out like, you know, if we, um, you know, we could, uh, we, end, uh, uh, we sort of ended up designing an infrastructure that could be used um, across the board. Um, so it's important to uh, like, you know, when it comes to making decisions, um, uh, you know, it's important to identify if it's possible to use it, um, uh, you know, reuse it in the future that can actually accelerate your future product development. And I think over time, we sort of um, developed this cookie cutter approach to things where once we have, you know, developed the, uh, the hardware necessary, we didn't go back to the drawing board to actually, uh, you know, go and uh, redesign things unless it was very, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, unless it was something very specific and it was definitely needed. Um, in that case, we sort of like, you know, try to uh, refine things and uh, the same applies to the, infra, uh, you know, to your infrastructure. For our first product, like, you know, um, we were learning a new uh, uh, and it's important to understand, um, you know, uh, like, you know, you, 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 uh, it's like learning to ride a bicycle, you know, um, so it's your first product. Um, you uh, you uh, put something in the customer's hands, you saw what worked and what didn't work. But over time, what we have realized is that to actually uh, like, you know, uh, narrow down um, the, the shortcomings and actually um, address them along. What this enables is that to actually um, uh, like right now, when we think about a, a, a new product uh, development opportunity, it's actually really easy for us um, to, uh, uh, you know, to take what we have and uh, to customize it uh, for, uh, for our customer. Uh, you know, it takes some time. I would say, you know, uh, keep at it, uh, you know, as you refine, you should be able to like, uh, you know, bring things together, um, you know, with uh, whatever you have in your organization. Uh, but, you know, it needs some resources and time uh, investment um, to actually get there. Thanks, Sai. Uh, Lily, how does all this growing um, uh, IoT transformation um, impact connectivity? How is it impacting it directly or indirectly? I mean, I think, I think it's definitely impacting connectivity because I think we need more infrastructure to support it. I know, I know we touched on a little bit. But, uh, you know, I, I think you think of it this way. I remember a few years ago, I tried to call my family on New Year's Eve. And, you know, guess, guess what everyone's doing? Everyone's trying to call somebody uh, on New Year's Eve to wish them a happy New Year's, have a chat. And well, I couldn't reach them because all the devices, and I'm in New York City with mass po you know, population, but mass fiber connectivity too. And I still, still couldn't reach them. So, you know, that's kind of a, you know, it's that, bandwidth that's really needed to support all these devices that is still needed out there. So um, that's going to impact more IoT. So we're not changing. We're not, we're not getting less devices right now. All we're doing is increasing those devices. So that was a few years ago. Um, I think it's getting better, but I think there's more room to grow. And I think it, it all starts from, you know, the the dark fiber, we probably need more dark fiber out there to support all the all the needs of IoT. So Carlos, why isn't the investment coming? Are IoT-based operations not worth the investment? No, I, th I think that's not the point. So uh, the IoT-based operations are worth the investment. Uh, usually if they are well thought and designed, they have high uh, ROIs. And I think the ROI is the metric to look at, not the, the investment. If you have a good environmental, commercial ROI, we, we should implement the projects. I think that one thing that I'm totally, uh, that I totally defend is what's very uh, said about the POCs. So uh, first do an implementation to test the use case and only then build uh, an entire network, okay? But my experience says that typically the IoT projects 
are uh, have a, a, are more easy to 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 get a, a higher uh, ROI if they are deployed on a, a company that has uh, operating expenses high operating expenses or if the downtime implies uh, capital losses like manufacturing for example or if the asset breakdown is uh, is a security risk for example on these three examples if uh, uh, the, an IoT-based operation that can uh, generate data can have a, a very, very quick uh, uh, return on investment because we are talking about the impacts uh, are being massive if, if the things are not doing as, as they should. Can I touch on that a little bit? I, I, think, I think you also have to take into consideration the the people who make the devices are not also the connectivity providers so there's really a disconnect between those two parties where who is creating the device and who's supporting the device and there's a disconnect on that one of you know a, an example i see is companies say like uh facebook or microsoft right they're starting to, to create their own fiber pipelines to their facilities to support their data but again they're supporter of the data. They're not, the, and their their own products as well. But they're not supporting everyone's IoT products. So there's a disconnect between companies who are manufacturing, creating the capabilities, and then actually delivering it. And a lot of times, when you look at the global perspective, you know, governments have taken into consideration that, and they really are making it more like a utility. Think of it as, you know, the power company, um, or you know. Uh, you have to think of it more of like a utility at this point. We have all these devices, we need to get them delivered, but they're not necessarily the same companies. Thanks, Lily. Um, I'd like to move on, Saverio, before you jump in. I just would like to um, uh, move on. I give you some time, but uh, I'd like to start our third topic, which is um, approaches and solutions. So we have enough time for Q&A. Um, and just a reminder to the audience, if you haven't been sending your questions, you can down below. Um, I know there's some of you watching not on the Zoom chat, and I'm really sorry um, that we're not able to get questions from you. Um, but if you have any, uh, find the Q&A and drop them there. Um, Saverio, go ahead. Um, I just I, I wanted to you know, play a bit uh, the, how can I say, the good guide on the connectivity side. <laughs> um, I, I just I want to say that the, the, uh, the IoT, uh, um, that they, they have di very diverse applications, which require very diverse uh, type of data and a very diverse type of data exchange. So if you are in a precision livestock application, which you want to monitor your animals into the field, you, know, you need 15 kilobytes to see where it is. So you don't need much. So in that sense, you can use a different type of connectivity. Uh, if you talk about using augmented reality for workflow management in an offshore or a manufacturer, you need a different type of connectivity. Uh, but uh, I think we should uh, always keep in mind that there are different type of connectivities that uh, they can serve this type, different type of application. So you can use LP1, low, low power wide area network, for example, for certain type of very small data exchange. You need 5G, and Lily is, is right, if we really we want to do uh, interactive workflow management offshore. Um, uh, maybe you need a, com a combination of those in, dif in, in different scenarios. So I think the connectivity, um, the, the, the connectivity options are there. There are quite few connectivity options are there. Uh, but historically, maybe uh, uh, we are a bit more moved towards, let's say, the kind of 3G type of world. Yeah, I'm using a, a telco side. And now we are moving towards the more high speed side of it. And I think 5G should be the one that somehow agnostically cover all this. Yeah, and enables you this, uh, this very diverse connectivity in IoT solutions. In fact, for example, in 5G, you have massive IoT type of connectivity on one side. If you remember the famous triangle from ITU, you have massive IoT, you have ultra broadband on the top, and you have uh, low latency on, on the other side. So in this way, you should cover a bit all of all the stuff. The investments needs to come, but also the standardization of 5G to cover all this is not completed yet. So. 
maybe uh, we 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 should we should be a bit more patient. I don't know, Lily, what do you think? <laughs> Um, I think there's going to be a, just a need. I mean, that's, that's what you're saying from the infrastructure bill right now, right? There's been a demand. And, and honestly, I think what's driven it the most have been um, the work from home and the learning from home. That's really driving a lot of everyone to wake up and say, hey, this is great that we have all these capabilities, but now we need to be able to actually use them. Definitely. So, so moving on to, to our third topic, um, Carlos, in the, in the future, um, what will IoT-based operations look like from, from your perspective? Um, for, on, on our perspective, uh, what, what we, we really think actually, it, it touches another point that we already talked. So I think the, the panelists are uh, really aligned on this. I think, uh, what I think that the future will look like, at least I hope, it's integration. Uh, integration is key on for me in all on all these systems to enable to um, to eliminate those roadblocks that Lily was saying that uh, someone that does the IoT, someone that deals with connectivity and etc. Uh, so integration between systems. Why not using the same IoT for multiple softwares or for multiple purpose? So we don't have the problem that's very already highlighted of having like uh, electronic trash, like three or two or three sensors measuring the same thing for different companies. I don't know. Um, I think integration between the platforms is it's key. And, and we already talked about prediction. Prediction, uh, so the data, that uh, IoT can give us can help us a lot on the prediction from the commercial point of view of, for example, our clients that can predict the behavior and uh, be aware that an asset has to do something until the prediction of the most impactful uh, topics that Severio talked about, uh, wildfires and water leakages and so on. I think prediction is something that uh, that um, at least I hope an IoT based operation will look like. Well, talking about solutions, uh, what security approaches can be used to minimize um, some of the security threats which we've already touched on? So what we all say and we see that cybersecurity in IoT is absolutely vital. And um, I'm going to name a few uh, approaches that uh, I believe can cover the main uh, threats that we mentioned. Um, first is uh, to use a trusted compute environment um, to secure the interfacing of an IoT device to the network and from the network to the device. Um, we're talking about the edge, uh, edge computing um, uh, network and technology that handles the IoT communication. It should be with a trusted compute server that identifies the IoT device and make sure that the data and application are secured and that they are accessed by the authorized machine or users. Um, another uh, key hardware that can be used and it's important to use, it's what we call the hardware security model, HSM in abbreviations, that it will combine with the public key infrastructure and uh, will, ha will handle secure distribution of cryptographic uh, keys that the IoT device can use to identify itself and make sure that the communications are encrypted. Uh, we want to use uh, strict access control. Um, what we know as a buzzword, but it's not a buzzword, this zero tr trust methodology. We don't trust anyone. We always ask the device and the user or machine that wants to access the device who they are. They have to authorize themselves again and again. So the privileged access management uh, to be in place. Um, security gateways. Uh, you can use a kind of, instead of a trusted um, environment, you can have a gateway that act like an intermediary between the IoT device and the network that enforces the um, authentication, gives more processing power and helps the devices themselves to, um, to better um, um, use the network uh, resources. 
um, updates and patches to solve security issues. We need to update the IoT devices and make uh, the software running on them up to date. So you need to use firmware over the air. So the devices should use them. Um, device authentication, authentication using uh, digital certificates. Um, these are uh, numerous uh, of approaches that uh, should be used and be implemented when we talk about uh, IoT and the security that it should uh, be uh, packaged with. By uh, touching on that, right, um, uh, on that point of security, talking about patching, how do you design products for legacy systems? For example, uh, how do you develop products uh, that are uh, for uh, part of a fully functional product ecosystem um, when inherently they're disconnected? Um, I would say, uh, you know, first of all, it's important to understand why are we designing a, a new product um, it's, if it's fully functional. Um, here's why. Um, I have come across applications where um, the um, the technology is sort of um, outdated and like you know or the vendor is not no longer in existence and they're you know they're not making it um, and um, uh, you know if you're but the product itself is quite successful so you know uh, it's important to make sure that you are designing a product that actually beats um um, those uh, expectations, uh, because, the, you know, the, we have already set a benchmark and, uh, you know, your stakeholders are going to be very reluctant to actually um, change um, because, you know, uh, we already have a functioning product, why should we design a new one? Um, uh, so, uh, and at the same time, you, you shouldn't be um, compromising on what features are already um, available. Trust me, this could be something as simple as a small um, LED on top of the device that just blinks every now and then. Um, you know, people are going to complain if that, if that particular LED is missing. You might have added a very new fee, you know, um, uh, like, you know, you might have provided any other means of uh, you know knowing uh, when there is trouble but when there is that uh, you know small blinking led people uh, are really going to want that small blinking led uh, and um, uh, you know and they're also going to argue that you know you cannot and it's also important to keep the price targets in mind um, you know the existing system costs so much it's um, uh, your new product is going to sound appealing only if it's you know if it's going to cost half as much you know it's important to draw your lines there and work your way uh, backwards and um, and while revising the product um, you know uh, make sure that um, any technological obsolescence um, could be easily addressed. We are working like, you know, especially when it comes to connectivity, um, if the technology does go obsolete, um, you know, you're able to find a, um, a drop in replacement for um, whatever um, you're installing. And uh, uh, it's, you know, it's not necessary to start from scratch, but, but a good place to start would be to actually talk to the person that originally designed the legacy system if possible. Uh, they might share some insights and uh, you know you don't have to go, um, you revisit the, the problems that they have already solved for you. So it's important to actually um, have that conversation to find out what they actually learned um, going through the process because you might think that something that exists in the legacy system is not entirely necessary, but you you know you might come out of the conversation with interesting anecdotes that you can uh, end up using and improving um, upon uh, using your new product. Thank you, Sai. Um, Lily, how do we see um, or how do you see maybe customers backing up their IoT capabilities? Well, you know, I saw Claude in the chat put put in edge computing. And uh, edge computing big when you talk about IoT, right? Because a lot of this compute for all of this IoT products is going to happen at the edge. And as an infrastructure supplier, we're, we're working with our customers to help them back that up at the edge. 
whether that's connectivity and transferring data to their final destination of a data center to literally backing up uh, that data at the edge with a UPS product or different types of technologies to uh, back up that information. So when systems are down. So edge computing, I think is a big part of how we're gonna see that backup and how we're gonna see the compute change and move. So um, I do think that's a big, big aspect of, of the backup process, but there's different ways to back up equipment. Uh, but more importantly, I think when we're talking about IoT is we're talking about like, how does it all move? And I think that's a good point that Claude brought up on the edge computing side of it, because all this stuff can't work without the edge computing. And then the final destination of where that data center is, it's holding all that data. Sai, so how do you decide between off-the-shelf solutions versus in-house product development? Um, what are some of the trade-offs that organizations need to consider that we already that we maybe haven't touched upon already? Um, I would say if it's a safety critical application, um, just go for an off-the-shelf uh, solution. If it's going to, you know, for example, I don't know, uh, operate in a refinery or something um, like, you know, they, it's a highly regulated inter industry and the people who already developed products um, uh, know what they're doing. They invested resources into actually developing off-the-shelf products. Uh, if it involves anything related to safety, um, you know, um, just go uh, and you go ahead and use off the shelf unless you are entering a new market um, space and that you and you want to explore that space. Um, uh, but otherwise, um, like um, my approach has always been when I come across a problem. I try to identify what products that are already out there and the only time uh, when I take an um, a, a custom in-house development approach is when the price targets are uh, critical. Um, you know, it's not exactly possible to use off-the-shelf solutions usually and meet um, such price targets. So um, at those times, uh, in-house product development uh, is, uh, um, you know, uh, it comes into play. But it's also important to consider, like, you know, what kind of development timeframes are we talking about here? Uh, because if you want to put something in your customer's hands, um, like right away, um, and if it's just one off, just go for it, um, just find something that's already available. And if it, if it can actually fit well into your existing infrastructure, you know, um, just um, use it. But if you're designing it um, around for a particular application, and if you think that this application actually has a business case that's going to scale really well, I think uh, that's the, the ideal candidate for actually um, developing an in-house product for all other cases to see. Like there are so many products and so many things out there today. Um, uh, you know, they are interoperable and like, you know, you can use it. Um, uh, uh, with relative ease um, uh, in uh, with, with most, uh, most IoT infrastructure tools. Lily, did you want to add something to that? Is that where your mic is off or? I think you did a great job of sharing that. Okay, uh, so, so I, I want to I want to um, ask Severi on a, uh, also I guess I'll ask it to, to all our panelists, so feel free to respond as well. Um, Let's go into the future. Um, what do what do we see in terms of? Uh, I mean, we talk about the use cases. We talk about our imagination, right? What does that uh, imaginary future look like, either as a utopia or a dystopia? <laughs> um, without, without going into utopia dystopia, what I would like to see. Uh, I would like to see uh, an IoT that is able to contextualize intelligence in a sense that uh, there is an application that requires only the monitoring, and probably we will have application requiring only the monitoring of an asset. There will be other application who want to do more. They want to do the prediction, as Carlos said, and want to be automated. Now, to do that, I think there needs to be uh, a quite uh, very well-refined data strategy for Roman organizations understanding where the data is and edge computing come into the story you know the balance between the cloud and the edge depending on the context on the applications too so uh, and then i would like also to see that this uh, context intelligence is uh, also driven by uh, um, 
you know, a, a correct use of data from a security and an ethical perspective. Because we cannot really sell products, uh, consumer products, that you go and see this code and you see the password of the product anymore. I mean, it's unacceptable. I mean, you cannot really see it. You're still seeing it. So um, I, I'm, I'm looking for these. I want to see these have been in this space for a long time. There are some stuff that is in this way, but there needs to be a bit more spread. In order to do that, let me counter argument a bit what Sai said. Yes, in house is cool, but in house is dangerous too, if you do not have the skills for doing it. And because the IoT requires different skills, as we said, uh, maybe uh, not necessarily buy off shelf from someone else, but also creating that ecosystem of partners that you have that, you, that enables you to build that solution. So you can have Sai, you can have Lili, you can have Carlos, because Sai, Lili and Carlos are doing different parts of it. So I, I think um, it is important to see the IoT in this, in a multidisciplinary way, therefore in an ecosystem way. Uh, and, and therefore the need of expertise is fundamental. Um, I think this, this is my view. <laughs> My I, I think we're just going to see more because I think, you know, I had a recent panel discussion on, on this edge topic and we talked about the fact that people are just going to want more. So you're going to deliver them more IoT products. You're going to deliver them more connectivity, right? And then you're going to want more. So what's after 5G? What's after, you know, uh, intelligent devices? I feel like as consumers, we're going to always want more. So... I think sky is the limit when it comes to the future on this topic. Yeah, maybe it's my age, you know, why I'm becoming old, but, you know, we need to go step by step. I understand that we want more because the data tells you that you want more because you can have more insights from the data and therefore you want more and more and more. And I'm with you, I'm, I'm with you, but I think we should, uh, you know, Let's not rush on things. In I a want sense it that... better <laughs> and I want it faster. And I think everybody wants, I mean, how many times do you look at our screen and say, okay. why is this not after going 5G, to my website fast enough? After 5G, <laughs> I invite you to see the 6G flagship research at Olu <laughs> University in Finland with quantum technology in it. And that is the next step. But it, we, right we are back by the line. Okay. We're already okay. talking about 6G, right? Um, yeah, and some... Uh, cellular providers now i think in the us are stopping to support 3g uh let's move to the next uh to, to the next uh segment which is q and a and uh, we have about 10 minutes so let's see what we can get through um somebody from our audience wrote hi sharif from this side i think they mean this side of the screen um i want to know how it's helpful in telecoms in the telecom sector um, and how IoT can impact the future um, of telecom. Uh, you mentioned a few use cases, maybe someone has uh, some more they can add. And I say a little bit on the telecom. I'm coming from the telecom, I should say something. <laughs> um, I, I think in, we should a bit, if we look at the history of all these, no? the first uh, machine to machine communication, so the M to M, were primarily telecom driven. Yeah? Not even the MNOs, the mobile network operators, but the so-called mobile, mobile virtual network operators. So it was very connectivity oriented. And was, you understand also why. I mean, they, they was really just looking at the data and exchange one type of data on one type of connectivity. It was not all the complications. Uh, and I think when the IoT came in, other angles are coming in. You know, Lily's angle, Sai angle, Carlos angle, the angle of the embedded systems, the angle of the application development, the angle of the uh, of the analytics, the security angle. The things become more complicated, and therefore for telecoms uh, they found them a bit lost, in my opinion. At that point, there will be a group of telecoms who have really take the IoT in a, with certain seriousness. Yeah, and the U in the USA, I think you look at the AT&T and Verizon story is interesting in what they are offering today, also around the 5G, particularly Verizon business. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Europe, you see the, you know, the Vodafone and the Telefonica as a good example. Uh, in Asia, you know, all the Japanese and, and China Mobile, that 
those what they are trying to do they are trying to get a bit behind the connectivity so they want to offer you more than connectivity they want to offer you the iot platform the device management the the connectivity management some of them are capable of doing it because they have work and some others a bit less uh, the, the future for them uh, is um, in some on one way on the 5g I think on the other way, and uh, maybe Tal can say something, I can see them building a role in, in the security side of it, you know, from the connectivity, but also from other aspects of the security. Um, and, but, you know, Telefonica four years ago had a, a unit called Luca, which was a security unit. And it's still there doing stuff. So uh, I think there is a, but they need to be a bit more courageous, in my opinion, to to go behind the connectivity. If they just offer the 5G as a connectivity, they will have a limited role. If they go a bit behind that, as they already tried to do some of them, their role will be slightly different, more prominent. This is my opinion. Sai, you have something to add to that. Yeah, um, I wanted to uh, share, um, you know, uh, a product developer's perspective when it comes to, um, you know, telecom providers and connectivity options. When I designed my first product with cellular connectivity, it was an uphill battle um, uh, to try and understand, you know, whom to pick uh, for, uh, you know, for uh, connectivity options. Like um, when we spoke to like, you know, telecom providers, they did not want to talk to us if we did not have large volume. And those that were willing to provide us um, actually had a unit cost per device that sort of made sense at the time, uh, but, you know, over time, but it did not exactly work for us, but we decided to move forward with it. Um, you know, four years down the road, uh, you know, things have evolved so much. It went from like, you know, uh, pr coming with the unit cost to like, you know, they are willing to work with you if you have a somewhat manageable uh, a fleet of devices. And from there, it, today it moved on to, oh, we'll give you uh, free data for, you know, um, X number of years. Um, so long as you use, you know, so long as you just buy our hardware, I was impressed by um, how things have evolved. And uh, to be honest, four years ago, I did not think we'll be at that place. Um, and, you know, I'm excited for what's in the, uh, you know, um, um, in the offering for the future. Can I say uh, another thing or I'll talk too much? I can no. stop. Uh, I just want to say, well, four years ago, five years ago, the mobile network operators, they look at IoT and they looked only at connected cars. And these were very large accounts, Volkswagen, BMW, you know, you make a lot of money just to put the SIM into the car. And that was the focus mainly. So they forgot everything about everything else, uh, the healthcare, all, all the other scenarios. Obviously, at some point, the other scenarios are covered by others. You know, mobile virtual network operators worldwide, they have an important role in providing connectivity here. And, and therefore, the, I think today, SAI is very happy because the operators is more switched on on the real opportunity. At the time, it was just one sector, actually one application within one sector. Today, the picture is almost every, is everything for them too, not only them. Thanks, Saverio. Uh, so so um, we're running a bit low on time. I'm going to ask maybe a final uh, question, and this is for... Um, Mrs. Yosupova, um, Lily, aka Lily, um, how does the Schneider Electric feel about passive data collection? This is from um, a question in our-, in our I, wanted, I wanted some more clarity on that. What do they mean by passive? I mean, we, sure. we feel like data, data is private. I mean, we focus on, you know, when we, when we have a, a cloud within Schneider, it's a private cloud. We keep our customer information private and secure. Um, so I think from our perspective, we're a business to business type of a, type of a customer and, uh, our customer data is private, but we do use, uh, that data internally to make our, uh, equipment better, our software better, our solutions better for the customer. Hopefully that answered it. Maybe then you will, um, expand on it for us. 
Um, but with that, uh, we're hitting our half hour mark. And I just wanted to say thank you everyone so much for joining. And uh, thank you everyone who's joining us at home. I know the winter is setting in and uh, it's getting dark out. Uh, we're, we're, sleeping, we're sleeping in more. Um, but it's going to be, I hope, a nice, uh, a nice, comfortable winter. And um, I hope everyone who's in quarantine right now is staying safe and healthy. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists. I will also add um, for your vast insights and a really wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed discussing this with you. And um, yeah, uh, these were all really fascinating topics that I think are really relevant uh, to, to what's happening. Um, what's happening today uh, in this age of transformation that we're experiencing and um, I hope to get to host you guys again and uh, discuss it more thank you thank you thank you very much bye guys good day good evening uh, good day one bye -bye. more thing and before we, we finish which is uh, if you want to anybody from our audience would like to get in touch with today's panelists feel free to reach out to them directly um, all of today's attendees will be receiving an email in the coming days with the contact information of each of our panelists so don't be afraid to drop them the line if uh, you have any further questions on today's topics. And if you want to stay up to date on Hub Security's upcoming webinars, you can follow us on LinkedIn, or also on Twitter, and we have a Medium. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.